All right, so we have learned how to calculate the amount of energy absorbed or released when matter uh, changes temperature. But what do we do when matter is changing phases? So we're going to look at on this page on state of matter change problems. And we'll start off just by labeling what is known as a phase change graph. So down here at the lowest temperature, um, you will see that we have um, a kind of a diagonal line here um, on the y, on the x y-axis we have temperature increasing and I'll just put this in degrees Celsius and over here on the x-axis we have the heat being added obviously that is the symbol Q and I'll just give it units of joules we'll pretend like this graph is of water just so it's a substance that we're familiar with and okay, so if we start down here at the lowest temperature least amount of heat being added that would make this state of matter a solid we increase the temperature and then you hit this kind of magic point where we see the graph leveling out here. So the temperature is not changing here from B to C. And okay. then we gonna, we're going to continue to add energy and we're going to start to see a temperature change again right here from C to D. That is when the matter is a liquid. Uh, particles are just speeding up as they you know, increase in kinetic energy. And then you hit a certain temperature at which the graph is going to level out again and um, there's no temperature change. Energy continues to be added and here from E to F we have a gas okay? and it's just going to increase in, in, in kinetic energy. So as we go along these diagonal lines there's a temperature change which means that there's an increase in average kinetic energy of these water molecules. Okay. Now on these flat lines, there's no change in energy, but there's no change in temperature, but energy is being added here. So what's happening on these flat lines? All of the energy going in is causing a change in phase. So it's going from solid to liquid here from B to C, which is a phase change called melting. If energy is released, now this matter is going to freeze. Okay. Adding energy here as a liquid, temperature is increasing, then we hit what's known as the boiling point here from D to E. So it's staying the same temperature, but now we have evaporation. Or if there's an energy, rele an energy um, release, we have it condense. So no change in temperature even though energy is being absorbed or released. Okay. Um, so down here, let me go back from B to C or C to B, this would be its freezing point or melting point down here. So we have melting point here or freezing point here. It's all the same temperature. Now for water, that melting point or freezing point is zero degrees Celsius. And you do have to know um, that water is zero degree. It freezes and melts at zero degrees Celsius and it evaporates or condenses at 100 degrees Celsius. So these are um, two temperatures that you do have to have memorized. It's ex the ACT actually expects that students are able um, to know that water freezes or melts at zero and evaporates and condenses at 100. Okay. So let's go down here and answer the questions um, here. So the horizontal lines on the graph, those represent where there is a phase change because there's no change in temperature even though there's energy going in or out. So those are phase changes. And it requires more energy. Let's look at the graph. So evaporating here, that is all of this energy from D to E, okay? whereas melting here only requires a smaller amount of energy. And that's because um, from, from melting, all, of their do, all the energy is just kind of loosening up those forces of attraction versus from D to E to go from a liquid to a gas, you have to break all forces of attraction. So that's going to take more energy. So vaporizing or evaporating requires more energy and that's because it has you have to overcome all forces
for all forces of attraction. Right, so let's scroll down here a little farther. Um, energy is required to change dynamic matter, even though temperature does not change, because all of that energy is going into phase changes. So how do we calculate the amount of energy that's needed to melt or evaporate? Well, there's no change in temperature, so we can't use Q is equal, Q is equal to MC delta T. And here is why. If I use Q is equal to MC delta T, and there's no change in temperature, so I put in zero for that. That would mean that Q would always end up equaling zero. But we know from looking at this graph that there is some change in energy, either absorbing or releasing here, when there's a phase change. So we using Q is equal to MC delta T just doesn't work for that. So we have two new formulas, and that is Q is equal to MH fused, and Q is equal to MH VAP. So basically the same formula. It's just that the heat of fusion, that H fuse and the heat of vaporization right here, um, those are just different physical um, constants that are plugged in. So heat of fusion is one number, heat of vaporization is a different number, and you're multiplying that by the mass of the substance. Okay. So heat of fusion is a physical property or a lookup value. Um, it's the energy that's needed to melt one gram of a substance at its melting point. Units are joules per gram. Heat of vaporization is the energy that's needed to evaporate one gram of the substance at its boiling point. Units are joules per gram. Again, it's a physical property. You look it up. So let's go down here. So the formula um, that you need to um, solve for when a substance is melting is Q is equal to M H fuse where heat of fusion here is a number that you look up. Heating is Q is equal to MC delta T. Okay? If you have a change in temperature, then you have to use MC delta T. Evaporating, now you have a different physical constant. You're going to find the energy by multiplying the mass of the substance times its physical constant, the heat of vaporization. Look this number up. Now, if you're freezing, Again, you're using heat of fusion, but you need to put a negative sign in front of the heat of fusion because energy is going out. That will cause Q to be a negative number. If temperature is decreasing, again, there's a temperature change. You use MC delta T. Um, we know if the temperature is going down, your delta T is always final. Your final temperature minus the initial so your change in temperature is going to be negative. Therefore, Q will end up being negative. Condensing, again, you're going to use Q is equal to MHVAP, heat of vaporization. But since you're condensing, that's exothermic, put a negative sign in front, so Q will get, be, end up being negative. Okay. All right, so let's flip to the next page. We're going to work some problems. So we have um, all of our physical constants are up here at the top, heat of vaporization of water, heat of fusion of ice, and then you'll notice that the specific heat of water is different than that of ice and of steam. And that's something that's unique to water because it has three different specific heats based on its state of matter. Okay, so we're going to see how much energy is absorbed when 30.3 grams of liquid water boils. So first identify what state of matter change is happening. There's no temperature change, so we can't use Q is equal to MC delta T. But we have a phase change because water is boiling. Okay? So that means we're going to use Q is equal to M times the heat of vaporization. So we're going to say Q is equal to the mass, 30.3 grams, times the heat of vaporization, which is this number up here, 2,000. 260 joules per gram, and you'll notice that your grams cancel, you're left in joules. So we take 30.3 times 2,260, and your, um, your, your calculator is going to tell you that that is times 30.3, uh, 68,478. But we're only going to use three sig figs because of our measure number. 
Remember, this number right here is a lookup number, so don't use that one for sig digs. So Q rounded to three sig digs is going to be 68,500 joules of energy. Okay, so we go down here to number two, how much air is released? 186.6 grams of water freezes. So again, a phase change is freezing. So I'm going to use Q is equal to M times the heat of fusion, but freezing is exothermic. So I'm going to put a negative sign in front. So Q is equal to the mass of the water that's freezing times its heat of fusion being exothermic. That's going to be negative, and that is 334 joules per gram. Where did I get that number from? I looked it up. So I go to the top of the page here, and I see that the heat of fusion of ice is 334 joules per gram. Okay. So down here, I see my grams canceled. That's good news. I'm left in joules, so I know I'm doing it right. My calculator is going to give you 28,924.4, but we can only have three sig figs. So Q is going to be equal to 28,900 joules of energy with a negative sign in front. And that's exothermic. All right, so number three, you're actually calculating the heat of fusion. You have, you have your mass and you have your joules of energy. So Q, 641.1 joules is equal to the mass, 652 grams times the heat of fusion. Okay, so heat of fusion is my unknown. I'm going to divide by 652 on both sides. Okay, so that cancels the 652 grams on the right side of the equation. I'm going to divide, and with three significant figures, your heat of fusion is going to be 0 0.983 in those units will be joules per gram, which is perfect because heat of fusion is in joules per gram. Okay, so those are some basic problems just with um, one equation on one phase change. But more than likely in real life, we're going to have um, when matter is changing states, it probably has to cool down or heat up or it has to go through multiple steps. Okay, so we're going to learn how to do a multi-step um, problem with an energy change. So calculating how many joules of energy would be required to change 32.9 grams of water starting at 35 degrees Celsius and change that to 120 degrees Celsius. So I like to do these problems with a, um, with a phase change graph um, nearby. So I would label solid, liquid, gas, it's water. So its freezing point is right here at zero. Its boiling point is up here at 100. Okay. Then I might go ahead and put in here, I'm starting at 35. So I'm just going to kind of estimate where that is. doesn't really matter, but I'm going to go ahead and write it down. And I'm heating it all the way up to 120. Okay. So if I were these water molecules, I would heat, increase in temperature, up to 100. And then at 100, I'm going to evaporate. And that's going to be all the way at 100. And then after all of those forces of attraction are broken, I would start increasing in temperature up to 120. So I kind of go through three steps. One, we're going to heat. Two, we're going to evaporate. Three, we're going to heat. So it's going to require us to do three calculations. And if we want the total, then we just add all of those energy calculations together. So for our first calculation, we're going to find joules needed to heat the water to its boiling point. Okay, because I'm going to go up to 100. So that's going to require me using Q is equal to MC delta T. So Q is equal to the mass of the water that's boiling, 32.9 grams. And now this is liquid, water is a liquid at the state, so I can use 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. 
then change in temperature, starting with its boiling point, which happens to be exactly 100, minus 35 degrees Celsius. That gives me a change in temperature of 65 degrees. Okay, don't worry about this 100 for sig figs um, because water boils at exactly 100. So we would get with two sig figs, 8,900 joules of energy. Okay, so we're going to need this number later. So that's the first step. Next step, we're going to evaporate it. Okay, so evaporation uses Q is equal to mHvap. I'm going to take the Q, find Q is equal to the same mass, should not be losing mass, times the heat of vaporization, which is of water, which is 2,260 joules per gram. Okay. Um, so now this with three sig figs comes out to be 74,400 joules. Okay. Now we've evaporated it and the water and the steam is going to continue to heat up to 120. So now there's a temperature change. We're using Q is equal to MC delta T. So Q is equal to 32.9 grams. Now you need the specific heat of steam. So if you look, you can look that up up here at the top. Steam is, uh, has a specific um, heat of 2.02 .02 joules per gram. So I'm gonna go back down here, put in my specific heat. Joules per gram, degrees Celsius. Then do my temperature change. Final 120 minus 100. So a temperature change of 20 degrees, which happens to only have one sig fig. So when I multiply these um, and, get, and round to one sig fig, we get 1,000 joules. Okay. Now we're going to add all of these together because we want the total. So I'm going to show you how to do this with the correct sig figs because now we have adding. So I have 8,900 joules plus 74,400 joules plus 1,000. Okay. So when you add all of this up, so you add up 8,900 plus 74, we'll zero, zero, plus 1,000, you get 84,000 300. But when I look at these numbers, so this number is good to the hundreds, this number is good to the hundreds, but this number is only good to the thousands, which means I need to round my answer to the thousands places. Because for um, sig figs for adding, you go by place value of least precision. So we get 84,000 joules total. Okay. So that would be your final answer.